you are soon going to be examined and questioned by God himself. What I saw as God was coming to me, and as it came across the sky, I rose in unison with it. And suddenly we were in, in the air facing each other. And there's a certain way that you can ask for things and get them. We're living in a time when you can say something and almost have it occur simultaneously. There is a barrier that protects our world from outside entities like demons or, or things like that. That barrier is dissolving and not as solid as it was, and things are getting in. At the age of six, I had a lot of different, what we would call psychic or paranormal experiences. Uh, they started out with dreams and out-of-body experiences. And I would have the dream and then an out-of-body and then a dream, maybe a different kind of dream, like a nightmare or a lucid dream where I was awake in the dream, then an out-of-body, then a dream. I would have like those in maybe about six a night of the various. And so I had these experiences from age six to 16. So within 10 years, I was uh, an expert at it. Really by age 14, in about eight years, because I would have them every night, year after year. So I got really used to them. And I saw how the dreams worked. I was able to see how the out-of-body worked. And once you get to the out-of-body stage, and these are like nighttime experiences uh, through the dreams and out-of-body. Out of the psychic abilities will awaken. Uh, usually during sleep, you'll first notice them. Like you might hear things as you're going to sleep. Then the dreams will become more colorful and vivid. There are certain things you can do that will help you to extend the dream and remember it with uh, crystal clarity. And we can get into that more. But I began having the out of bodies and dreams mixed with each other and layered on top of each other for 10 straight years. By around age 13 or 14, I was fully used to them and could control each one. And once you get past the out of body stage, and it's, it's, it sounds easy, but it's not. Yeah, both the dreams and the out of bodies it does take time and a full interest in wanting to do it. But once you get to the out of body stages, those two nighttime experiences, then the psychic abilities begin to occur in the daytime. So we are having the psychic experiences at night with the dreams and out of bodies, and then in the day with the regular psychic experiences. And then you are 24 seven psychic. You're psychic the entire day and night. And that's when a lot of things happen, really good things. So psychic experiences, the dream started with the dreams, the out of bodies began having them in the daytime. And at that time I didn't like them. I was in junior high and high school. I just wanted to be a normal high school athlete doing my thing. I didn't want the nighttime things uh, keeping me awake or scaring me with some kind of falling dream. I just wanted to, but at age nine, I had asked God to give me all of those secret knowledge and abilities. I forgot about that, but at age 11, they came on full bloom. And so it's forced to, by my own like uh, prayer, to have them. And I told God that if you show me everything in the invisible world, because I knew that there was one, I was nine. They started at six. If you show me everything in the invisible world that no man or king has ever known, I'll always tell people about you. And so at age 11, they started heavily. And I had forgotten about the prayer, but God did. So at age 14, and like I say, I was uh, an athlete, football, track, basketball, wrestling, swimming, competitive, and water polo, like the water soccer. And so, and we swam in the lakes too. I used to live in Ohio, we swam in the lakes and the waterfalls during floods. So we could really swim well. So I jumped into this lake. Our church was having like a youth group picnic. I jump into a lake, I jump up high and I come down feet first and get stuck in the muck. And I had a, a, a big near death from that. And because of the dreams and out of bodies, uh, the near death is an out of body, but a spiritual one. Because of those dreams and out of bodies, I was able to more recognize where I was and see it for what it was. And we can get into that later. But that was the youth. In my 20s, 
Uh, I began to acknowledge the psychic abilities and then develop them. And, and then I also studied and learned more about them. 20s and 30s. By, the, by my late 30s, some scientists heard about the near death and the other experiences and asked, asked people to write to them. And so I did to this one scientist because he seemed like he believed in the near death. And that was 97. I had been studying and watching the other near deaths all along, especially in the 80s and studying the top scientists as well as the experiences to see exactly how their their near NDEs was like mine or different than mine. And so in 97, I was invited by the top near-death scientists in the world to come and research with him. They would study me. I would tell them about the near-death. I was with him for two years till 99, till three years, till 2000. Then I switched over to the female world authority at Water. She's the number one now. Um, at the same time, I was also working with Dr. Jacobs, the UFO world authority back then in the 90s. And he was deep. I worked one on one with him for 12 years, and I still keep in contact with Dr. Atwater. So there's been a lot. After the research was done in 2002, I relaxed for a couple of years. I do films too. And then around 2006 or so, I, 2007, I decided to write the book based on the research. And it turned out well. So that's like the early days, Sabrina. Amazing. And when you had your near-death experience, what did you experience? And also, it sounds to me like you were already, since you were a child and you were having these different experiences, it sounds like you were familiar with being able to control where you went. So did it feel like something unknown and weird, or did it feel like something that you were maybe expecting or you thought you knew what you were feeling? Half and half. A lot of it I was used to, like the floating, when you're floating in, in the air. That's, that's in the, you, when you're in the spiritual state, you'll like levitation is normal and natural. The knowing things automatically, uh, the popping from one scene into another scene, like you can do that in a dream or an out of body. There's, and I'm sorry, Sabrina, what was the question again? Yeah, so it was, because it sounds like you had different experiences as a child. So I was thinking maybe it's not as unexpected when you had the near death experience. It doesn't come as a surprise as most people that, for instance, have an accident and then they have this kind of an experience, they don't usually have a frame of reference. So they're just thinking, well, maybe I'm hallucinating or I don't know what that was. It wasn't a dream, but they don't really know how to place it. But I get a feeling that you felt it was more than a hallucination or just something weird happening to you. Yeah, yeah. I now see, and I had my most, I was 14, so I was in the mid 70s, like 74 or 75. So back then, a near death had, hadn't started yet. It started in 77, near death research. I knew something spiritual had happened to me, but I didn't, there was no name for it, but I remembered it well. I was used to it because it wasn't out of body, just a spiritual one that dealt with the universal fabric and it dealt with God and it dealt with the person's spiritual soul self. So yeah, I was semi used to it, but not fully because I was having the out of body, but in a different space and a different time, a different dimension and a different event like uh, time. Like there is in those kind of invisible realms, there is no actual time, but events are like times. Like I did this at this point, or I'm going here. And so I was aware, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you about my near death because I was aware of a lot of things and the near death explains a lot of things too. And I'll explain how in my near death, how it, the difference between like a regular out of body or so, and then so I jumped off the lake, go in feet first, get stuck in the, I was stuck up into the knee. I could not get out. I yanked and yanked and, and then swallowed what seemed like a trash can full of that lake water. I was fully full with it. My arms were stretched out 
and then I fell to the side with my legs still stuck in the muck. And when I fell down, the muck came up and covered my whole body like a, a death blanket. And I was still alive, but I was shivering fully. And at that time, I, uh, the person, when there's, that's the struggle for life and death. It's kind of, the near death has several stages that it goes by. Everyone doesn't remember each stage, but everyone does go through it. And so the first is that struggle, unless it's an instantaneous death, there's a struggle for life and death where the person is fighting and struggling to stay alive. And I had choked in all the water, was laying down on the bed of the lake underneath and was waiting to see if anyone would come down and see that I was missing, come down get me. No one ever did. So uh, I was able to slowly watch because time slowed down. And that's another difference. Time will slow down when you're in another dimension or another, another like mental level of consciousness. That way, the level of consciousness is the how aware you are, how perceptive you are of what is happening right then, especially to you. So I was full with water. I had stopped moving. My organs and stuff were still working, but the paralysis of death was starting to creep in. And it started just like an out of body. It started at my toes and worked its way upwards. Toes, thighs, chest and stomach, neck, until I was fully paralyzed on my side and couldn't move. I could only look straight ahead. And I could see on the side, but I couldn't move my eyes. At that same time, Sabrina, the I could feel and automatically knew which organs were going out. And they went off like soft candles. And I knew that was the, the kidneys. That was the liver that stopped. It didn't hurt, but you could feel it just being blown out like a candle. And you knew exactly that automatic knowledge. You knew exactly what was happening. So the organ stopped. I was looking straight ahead. The only thing that was going was the eyes, the ears, the hearing, and the beating of the heart. I could feel the, and at the same time, the time of the time perception slowed way down into a dream consciousness, the kind of consciousness that you have as you're falling to sleep. It's exactly like you're falling to sleep with a, a heightened sensation because uh, you're more aware. You're aware that you're going to die. There's a certain point you know that you're going to die. You realize inside, I'm not going to be able to get out of this one. And, and then there is, after the struggle for life and death, if the person does not win that struggle, they at a certain point accept it. And also around that point, there's where the person is once in pain and in primal fear, there's a switch over and there's a sudden calm warmth. And like I was fully freezing and shivering on the lake and covered in that soot. But once that switch over, all the pain went away, the shivering stopped, I felt warm. And I also, I felt that everything somehow would be all right, even though I knew I was stuck and I was paralyzed in just about uh, dead. And uh, so eventually, and time slowed down even more now, the heartbeats also got slower in approximately the same rhythm as the time slowed down. So I was definitely in a dream consciousness. And I watched and monitored because in the out of body stage, and it helps if you can do it in the dream too, you want to remain as fully calm as you can so that you can record everything mentally that you see and that happens so you can recall it later and so you can accurately see what's happening because when when you start to get into the higher stages of consciousness when your mind begins to drift into another reality there are illusionary veils in those other realities in the same way that sleep paralysis so the person is paralyzed on their bed they can't move they're awake and they know they're awake but they can't move and they begin to see things flitting about the room or standing near the bed in real life those things would be invisible but because the person is partially out of their body and in the dream consciousness they can see although physically awake they can still see uh, shadowy figures of that other world some are illusionary and some are real 
Uh, that's an interesting thing that sleep paralysis. And that was exactly what was happening to me uh, at the depth scene of that lake. I was fully paralyzed. Heart was slowing down and eventually the heart did stop. And it stopped at the same time, <clears throat> the vision went out. With a loud boom, I was had flatlined out and everything went black. There was a, a dark void that I was in. So this is where people say that they have the tunnel. There is no actual tunnel. That's, that's an illusion. And the beginning of other illusions that are along an out of body or a, a near death. But the tunnel is really the person's spirit body coming out of the physical, just like we do every night when we go to sleep. When we go to sleep, we don't recharge because we sleep. We recharge because our spirit body comes out of the physical, usually stands itself up near the room or bed, and then recharges in the electromagnetic energy that's in the air. It's called prana. The Indians call it prana. The Chinese call it chi. And in the Star Wars, it's that thing that they call the force. Um, that's what charges us. And we are astral body, the body that will live on after death, comes out during sleep, recharges, then comes back in when you wake up and it comes back down in. When people have falling dreams, usually they are coming back in from an out of body and they see it as a dream or flying dreams. Those are out of bodies that the person didn't realize they were having an out of body. So getting back to the death, completely paralyzed, heart stops and the vision goes out with it. And that's why the body must be completely paralyzed. Uh, and at death, it, it naturally, that's the final sleep paralysis that you will feel. Uh, because whenever you have sleep paralysis, that's usually a signal that you're about to have an out-of-body experience. And even at death, so at death, when the body paralyzes itself, the person is getting ready to exit the body. Because if the, there were no paralysis, the person's willpower would stop the paralysis. And in the real world, they would never get to sleep and then they would never die. <laughs> but you can't do that because at a certain point, life, the life force is cut off. So sleep, the paralysis during death, I was having that. I die. I, I don't wake up, but I find myself in this dark void. And this dark void lasts between 15 and 22 seconds. And that is literally death itself. Within 22 seconds, the person usually will pop awake out of their body and above their body too. They'll look down and see themselves. You'll be able to see what had just happened to you. And you'll remember, I just had a heart attack. I was just hit by a car. And you'll realize that, wait, even though I'm dead, the real me is still alive and awake. And that's called, that's what I call reconsciousness after death. Now my near death went on way after that. When I regained reconsciousness after death, I woke up in the air floating in a gyroscope like a sphere. And this was on the molecular level. I could see the atoms, they were spinning too. And I woke up spinning inside of what would be a giant, not a giant, but a, a Leonardo da Vinci type diluvian man sphere. I was inside of it. And it dissolved as my consciousness dawned and awakened. And by the time I was fully awake, the sphere had disappeared as I awakened. I realized that I was somewhere in time and space. I knew I wasn't on the earth because I was floating. I realized that I was somewhere in time and in a certain space, space meaning dimensional location and the time meaning the event, what was literally happening right then. I realized that the time was the time of my death. I could see myself down there at the bottom of the lake still drifting side by side. The time was my time of death and the space was the afterlife of death or the afterlife. As soon as I realized that I was alive after death, I disappeared and reappeared in another scene. And that's a lapse of consciousness in a dream or an out of body. You always want to look for this continuation of the scene where you're suddenly in one scene and then suddenly you're somewhere else. That shows a lapse of consciousness. And it's important because something may have happened to you between here and there. So I always want to look for a breakaway where you're in one scene and then suddenly you're somewhere else. That's always interesting to note.
Although you, there will come times in out of bodies and in dreams where you'll be talking to someone or interfacing with something non-verbally and they will disappear or you will disappear from them. And that's because your level of consciousness has changed or theirs did. And we'll explain that too. So I, real, I realize, I have the realization of time and space. I realize that I am alive and I'm somewhere in space and time. I'm in the time of death and the location dimensional is the afterlife. Then I suddenly appear floating in midair in, let's see, in this thing right here. Let's see, yeah, pull it down. I woke up in this circular wheel. The wheel had three screens on it and the wheel was revolving around. The inside of this wheel was going one way, the outside was going the opposite way. And that's important too, we get into that later too. But this was my life review where I was shown everything I ever did, thought or said. And I was shown all these things inside my mind, multidimensionally, where I could see it all at once. And just like you've heard with others, you uh, are shown everything you did, said, and thought, even to yourself in secret, by yourself in the woods. And you're shown this because you are soon going to be examined and questioned by God himself. So he's showing you first what you did in your life so that you can't then say, I didn't do that because he just showed you. But the life review is an interesting thing. And now during this life review, a voice asked me, what have you done for others? What have you done to help yourself? And have you always believed in me? And the answer was yes to all of those. Uh, at the same time that he was asking those questions, there was a secondary figure to this voice exhorting the voice in my behalf that I was a good human, I deserved to go to a higher level or the highest level. And some people might call this Mohammed, some people Jesus, Buddha, you know, whoever, son of whoever. But there was a higher spiritual figure not the top one, but the second in command, exhorting in the human's behalf to let him get into heaven. So you have the life review, you have the figure exhorting to the voice that I was good as a human. I was only 14. So the life review went well, the questions were answered. I was shown what I had done, the little I had done at age 14. And then again, another lapse of consciousness where I found myself on a beach-like setting. First thing I noticed that there, there was a sun across the sky on the other side of the planet. I could see it rising up. And as I watched this orange sun, I rose in unison with it. Let's see, I rose in unison with it in the air. And without seeing it move, it went from here to here, well, it went up. Without seeing it move, it went from here to here, and then suddenly right in front of me. So it went across the sky, but I didn't see it move. And that was interesting too. Flight, a lapse of consciousness. But those things, in those, in, that, in those invisible realms, you just accept things. You don't super react to them. You don't even react at all. You accept it and, and interface with it if you can. So this thing that I saw as God was coming to me. And as it came across the sky, I rose in unison with it. And suddenly we were in, in the air facing each other, about maybe a half a football field away. As it came across the sky, it changed colors from orange to a red. The red was God's forgiving. And these colors that came down on me had a super strong effect. So the orange was for health and the uh, healing of any injuries, like physical, mental, or spiritual. The red was God's love and forgiveness. And that was a strong one. That, those rays were super strong, where you could feel them. At that point, I had that, what they call that reverential fear of God. I knew it was God. I could feel it. And I was literally vibrating in ecstatic rapture, undulating waves of ecstasy. I mean, really, real ecstasy. Ecstasy to the point where it was becoming uh, noticeable. And I was watching that. And then the after the red light of God's love, 
And that ecstasy level is where the mystics, the priests, the nuns, all of them, many of them do get to that level, but all of them strive to get that ecstasy, nirvana, and bliss level. That is that one where you're almost at God. These rays that came from the sun sphere, it's a sphere of consciousness, uh, had an effect on me physically and physio spiritually. Not only did they clean me physically, they cleaned me spiritually too. Because the human has to be clean as you move to up to the higher and higher levels, up to the highest level, because you can't go in your human condition, condition and get close to God. So he cleanses you first three times. And the white light was the strongest cleansing. That's the cleansing that elevates the person to a universal level and a universal consciousness where you are merged in with everything and you become one with everything. The out of body does it, but this white light level and the NDE is a spiritual out of body, but in the out of bodies and people should fully work on the dreams of the out of body because in the out of body, the out of body in a person produces a merging and melding quality. And like, here's a quote from my book, concentrated focus during advanced meditation produces a merging into things where one becomes one with one's object of focus and the out of bodies bring that merging quality in where you can merge with people places and things obtain their essence all at once here's a good example and then we'll get back to the white light so the girl is out on a date with a new guy and she doesn't know how how he is or what he may be like in the future. So she simply does a few silent breathing, breathings in and out while he's talking about the football game or something like that. While he's not fully paying attention, the girl does a few breathings in and out. And after about 30 seconds, while she's just watching and listening to him, his words will dim down and she'll be able to see the essence identity of this person's character nature intelligence and all of that and then she can decide if she should deal with them or not but that's another a small example of that merging quality so but getting back to the white light yeah that's the highest and strongest light of the near death and that's the that's a full spiritual light and it fully permeates you and it heightens you in every way and this is where people come back from the near death in full health, even if they were sick. They come back with like an expanded knowledge. They come back the same person, they're just more of themselves. And a lot of times they know things that they didn't even know about or study before. The basketball player might come back knowing about engineering or physics or medicine. So it's so that white light, that was the final cleansing before I would meet and then merge with God, which is the mystic's highest goal. That's his only goal. And it can be done repeatedly. You can do it over and over. And that's the human being's subconscious desire is to meet with at meet and merge back in with that who has created him. Everyone deep down in their heart wants to do that. They want to go home. And uh, the person gets during a near that gets to see God if they're lucky, uh, but you can see God. You can see God without even having a near death. But during the near death, you get to see God or feel him. You get to merge and meld with him. You cannot obtain the essence. You can know that he is God, but you cannot know him. I try to look at God. So anyway, I go through the white light. And then there's another lack of consciousness as, as I get into this higher stage, the final stage before resurrection. So I wake up. And I wake up on the floor and I'm, I'm looking around I, and I start to see some beings in the background. And as soon as I notice them, there's a being right in front of me. And this being was what we would call God. I start to look at this being because remember you have that merging quality. And once you look at something and want to know about it, you automatically know everything about it or can merge into it and feel its essence. And I'll give you a quick example of that. I was having an out-of-body one night. This was in real time. I was asleep, 
time was about 12.30 when I was asleep, and in real time it was about 12.30. I woke up while flying down a football field on the sideline. I was flying down the football field. I saw some cars in the distance going the same way, a few blocks away. So I decided to race those cars. It's interesting the things that attract you when you're in out of body. I decided to race the cars. And just as I got to the end of the football field, I stopped because something was in front of me that I couldn't see. I automatically knew it was, what, that there was something there. And when I looked around, I looked at a certain clump of bushes and what was, what was there, that's what made me stop. So I flew, automatically flew into it and flew out within about one second. And it was some kind of small animal, a skunk, a rabbit or something that saw me in a form and got scared. And I felt his fear and then swooped into it and came back out into my astral form that I woke up from the dream, but remembered that well. You'll remember the astral out of bodies and the real spiritual experiences you'll remember, even if they're in dreams. And you can get to some powerful levels from dreams. Those dreams and initial outer bodies are the stepping stones to all a lot of other stuff. So I'm sitting across, back to the near, I'm sitting across from this God figure. And as I try to merge with his essence to know who he is, the thing that we're sitting in begins to move around, begins to move around. What would be us mingling fully? So we were about to coalesce, and I wanted to make sure I looked into this being's eyes, because all I needed was a one or two second look so I could determine it was something real, something imagined, or what. And it knocked me out. But I looked up again to see what it was and to see the details of, and then it knocked me out fully. And, and as the mixing coalesced and coalesced, and then I, the next thing I knew after that, I woke up at the bottom of the lake. Something yanked me out of it, and I swam up to the dock and choked out all of the lake water and then crawled up the beach. And I was in full shock, and all I remember was rubbing the muck off of my leg. And uh, so that, and then... That near death would produce a lot of after effects and a lot of other experience, but that was the near death experience. Wow, that's such a fantastic story. And I think you also tell it in such a special way because of your knowledge in this area that you're able to explain everything so clearly for everybody to get a good picture of it. Thanks. What I was really struck by was your your opinion on dreams and because i come from the perspective and i've never put a lot of thought in it but i just thought dreams are dreams it's just something that you know there's a mix up of chemicals in your brain things that are relaxing things that aren't um so i don't know much about the significance that they would have so walk me, I think our perspectives on dreams are completely different. So I wanted to know more about your take on what dreams are and how can we read different signs into our dreams? Okay. Yeah, dreams are the first door or the key to all the other rooms in God's paranormal mansion. And there he has a lot of room. So dreams are the initial key. And dreams are also the door that you can go into to become more acquainted with your own higher self. We are not one. We are two. There's two of us. Uh, we have a physical and a spiritual self that looks exactly like us. And that's inside of us, ready to help us like a genie. It's our subconscious, our subconscious mind. Now, our conscious mind, the mind that we use right now, is the boss of our subconscious, that invisible genie that is our higher self. It's the, but the subconscious is here to serve us, even though it's smarter and more powerful than us. It is our own higher self, it does look after us, closer than an angel. So it's good to, dreams can help you get to know your higher self. And this is true. And in the Bible, it says, if the two of you ask in my name anything in this world, it will be given to you by the Father who is in it. And that's true, because I tested it when I was 19. I tested it all my life. And by the two of you, Jesus meant 
it could mean husband and wife or business person and business person or to a prisoner in a jail or an old man in the hospital or on a deserted island by himself the two of you to them means your awake self and your higher invisible spiritual self and when those two minds begin to talk to each other non-verbally and you get to know and learn how to communicate with that higher invisible side of yourself then you can easily have anything in this world that you want but by that time you get to that level there won't be a lot of things in this world that you will want you'll be into higher things and invisible truths in knowledge there's a lot to learn out there and you can also use those things to help other people too that's a good part about it or to protect yourself but you want to get in contact with your own self that's inside of you that's your real self and it's there to help you and will always help you and during dreams is when we're in close contact, is when we're in nonverbal communication. The dreams are a nonverbal communication to us from our higher self. And so we have to make sure that we have dreams, make sure that we remember them, and then begin to read the nonverbal feelings, thoughts, and images in the dreams. Because once you, the dreams can, explain a lot everything from the levels of consciousness to the out of bodies in fact you can out of body from a lucid dream like a flying dream it's interesting the dream is a world unto itself but the dreams will lead you whether you want to or not usually to an out of body especially if you're a student and you study these things so the dreams will lead you to the out of body during the out of body you become fully your higher self and your conscious self is laying down in bed. That's when you really begin to know and cement the two, the two consciousnesses together into this one conscious, where you're where in the daytime, you're looking for messages from the invisible world. And when you're asleep and dreaming, you're looking for messages in the real world. You're continually attuned at all times. And dreams and out of bodies can help you do that. That's super important. And also along with those things and to help facilitate and increase the clarity of both of those things and the, the occurrence rate of both of those things and the speed of psychic development, the person will want to add deep breathing exercises to the psychic development. The breathing exercises alone will bring out the psychic powers and the dreams will be clearer the out of bodies will begin to emerge too, especially if you want them or you try to have them. There are steps that are connected to the dream that lead you right into an out of body, like the paralyzation. Whenever you feel yourself half paralyzed and can't move when you're trying to wake up, just surrender and let yourself be paralyzed. But do the deep breathings right then through your stomach because you're so paralyzed, you can barely move anyway. The only thing you can really move is your stomach. So move that in and out and you'll be able to stay awake and literally see yourself come out of your body. You'll be in two bodies at the same time because you have, you have a dual consciousness, one for each body. Your spirit mind has its own consciousness. Here's an example of that. The person's on the operating table. The doctors are working on them with a saw. The, because of the anesthesia, the person pops out of the body and sees the doctor down there sawing on them. And they can feel it in their invisible astral body. And they can also at the same time feel it in their physical body. So there's a dual consciousness that's operating at the same time. One is just dimmed down while the other is more active. But if you can get those two to activate at the same time and to communicate back and forth with each other non-verbally, you can do some deep stuff. So that's what's happening with the dreams and other bodies. Amazing. And yeah. you mentioned okay. being able to control your dreams since a very early age uh, as well, that we are able to do that as well. So is it then just through breathing? that we're able to control our dreams? Well, the control of the dream kind of starts with learning how to have the dream and then learning how to remember it. And then the control aspect will begin to come in. 
after that. Like there's a certain way you can go to sleep and a certain time you can go to sleep that's natural for yourself where you can more likely to have a dream and much more likely to have an out of body. The person usually has, the person has two out of bodies and the person dreams whether they, usually a person dreams whether they remember it or not. Sometimes you can have a straight sleep where you just a blackout and you sleep to re fully recharge. So we were talking about how we can control our dreams and, yeah. and it is not just through breathing, but that we can go to sleep at a certain time and that makes it more likely to have an out of body. You have an excellent memory. I think. Yeah, yeah. So there are certain times to go to sleep and certain ways to wake up. Most people forget their dreams because they wake up too quickly. The key to remembering your dreams when you have them is to, once you wake up, realize, look around for a second, see where you are and make sure you're safe and stuff. And then close your eyes again and go right back into the last memory of the dream. If you can remember the last detail and never wake up too fast, especially if you have a dream, stay there for a few minutes. Because a lot of times you can go back into a dream or you can have an out of body because you're recharged, but still in that sleepy state. So always wake up slowly if you can. The person, you wake up slowly, you close your eyes once you realize you're safe. And then recall the last scene of that dream. And usually you can recall the scene before that. So you go backwards, dream scene by dream scene. And a lot of times, especially if you, because sometimes I wake up and immediately close my eyes. I know where I am. I'm in my room. And you can remember almost, a lot of times you can remember the entire dream. But you can always get at least halfway through the dream, especially if you do it right then. Try not to get up and write it down. That's after you re-remember it. So you have to go to bed right. You have to wake up right. And you have to understand what happens in the dream itself. Because there's a lot of dream clues that shows the person that they're, you're not awake. You're dreaming. Like here's one. You might be running and running in slow motion. Or feel that your legs are in quicksand. Here's another one. If you jump up in the air and come down slowly, you're in a dream or another spiritual dimension or another planet. But that's another test. Here's another one. And this could be for dreams or out of body, but it's usually for out of body. But out of bodies and dreams can be so indistinguishable that it's not easy to tell what you're having, except through experience. The person will be walking in a dream and they'll be talking to people and in a store full of people, but no one seems to notice them and is walking right by them. Even when you talk to them, that's when you're having an out of body, but you think you're having a dream and you're somewhere in real life thinking that you're awake and you are awake, but in dream consciousness. So the out of, now had the person been in that dream scene where they were talking to people walking by and no one seemed to even see them. And they realized, wait a second, this is a dream. They would literally wake up in real life at the dream location, but in, invisible and in real life. So you can dream yourself into an out of body that way by realizing what kind of dream it is. Here's another dream clue that you're dreaming. You can look at a clock and when you look at the, you know, the, uh, the whatever you call them, going around and around, they move and squiggle. Or you look at a newspaper and the words turn and twist on the page. That's a, a, a dream clue that you're dreaming. Another way to have an out of body through a dream, and I used to do it every night, I would, as I'm going to sleep, picture myself climbing up a ladder. And by the time I got to, I would also be doing the breathing exercises too. By the time I got to the top of this dream imaginary ladder, I'd be high up into the clouds, like in the Roadrunner cartoon, high up into the clouds. I would be 75% sleep and a quarter, 25% awake, vaguely awake, more in the dream than awake. The dream it gets so vivid at that point that I could look down at the ladder or trapeze and there would be snow along my feet and wind. Eventually, because that was the thing, eventually the dream, the ladder or trapeze would disappear and I would fall. And as I was falling, I would struggle. And it seemed like the, the faster I struggled, the faster I went down. And I would wake up in bed at the end of the fall. 
So I had this dream over and over and over. Like one summer, you know, the whole summer I had it. So after around 60 times, I realized, wait a second, this is that falling dream. I'm not going to get hurt. So I let myself go. And then I started to slow down. And when I started to slow down, because I wasn't afraid of falling, I said, well, maybe I can fly. As soon as I said, I said fly. And that was how I learned. One, That's another way where you can go from a lucid dream into the out of body. It's interesting, both of those things, and they really do happen. The out of body in real life, and the dream happens in some kind of a dream plane. Because I've, I've woken up, going back to sleep, and going back into the same dream uh, 20 minutes later after I woke up. So it's interesting. And they say that's when that's why when people have dreams and you go to you wake up and then you go back to sleep that next night, the dream seems like it's, some say it's just a continuation of that one dream that you woke up from and you got on back. It's interesting. Dreams, uh, the out of bodies are interesting. And those things, just from having them, most spiritual things, UFOs, near death, haunted houses, dreams, out of bodies, will give you spiritual psychic abilities. But don't get hung up on the psychic abilities when you start to know things or know what someone's going to say, or, because it'll slow you down from the progress you could make, continuing to go higher and higher in those higher realms and always ascending and always heading towards God, to the highest height. But yeah, dreams and out of bodies. Amazing. That brings me to another one of my questions that I had for you. So I was told at one point that almost anybody has some sort of psychic ability. How much we're able to develop it, it really de- and how much we're born with, it really depends on. So for instance, you had this dream since you were a child and you chose to develop that. Um, so I would like you to comment on, do we indeed all have psychic abilities within us? And if somebody wanted to develop theirs, what would they have to do? Okay, yeah, we all do have psychic abilities. And this world, this country, this time, people are more into outside material things. And the psychic abilities are inside inner things, the inner development. But we all have them naturally, but we just don't use them. We don't even practice them. And we don't know about them. Like, here's the difference. Here's the difference between a psychic and a mystic. The psychic has abilities that they neither fully understand nor fully control, whereas the mystic, and an atheist can be a psychic, but the mystic, his primary attention and concern is about meeting, mixing, and understanding, and merging with God. And the mystic has had all those psychic things experiences and has mastered them easily you have to to get to those higher levels and you learn a lot on each step of that path but the mystic's true focus is the one-on-one union with god and to do it over and over and that merging with god it's some call it a marriage with god but the deep thing and it's one of the highest things a person can do is to know who god is in search for God. Like, here's one of the quotes from the book, too. Our our primary purpose as human beings is to find ourselves, then find our God within ourselves and by ourselves. And uh, we are to develop ourselves so we can serve God. And then when you do that, it easily gives you anything you want, anything. I've gotten almost everything I've wanted. And uh, But when you get to that point, you only want him and you don't the things of this world you don't even want things so it's a good that's a good high place to do any and it's good to see the young people involved now because all of those disciplines all of those experiences are worth studying on a high or a high level of study whenever you study something invisible the invisible spiritual sciences that's a deep thing you're like a priest or a nun or a a Mother Teresa, those the people are no better than we are. And uh, God can show you your true self. And I like with the psychic powers, we barely use any of them. But they can be quickly developed. And the way to that is to, person has to first want to have this 
abilities, the strong desire, where you're thinking about them 24 7. And the more you think about something, especially if you know exactly what it is you want, the faster it moves to you and as you go to it. So you have to know exactly what you want first. With the psychic abilities, the best way and most natural, fastest way to get them is with the breathing exercises. Most people are shallow breathers. The normal person only gets about 30, 35% of oxygen in their body. The athlete gets about 70, 75. So the spiritual athlete has to get 75 or even more. Deep breathing do so, so much for the body. They clear out the arteries of the mind and the brain. They uh, clean the heart vessels and the arteries of the arms and legs and thighs. The healthier you are, as a, a, a near athlete, the more these abilities will come into the cleaner your vessel, especially in the way of thinking too, not just health, but thinking of high thought, thought thinking in divine ways. Uh, the higher the thinking, the cleaner the mind will be. And the cleaner the person and the person's character in nature, the higher you are inside and you want to be, the more God will give you because he knows you will use it in a good way. So the better character of the person, the higher amount of these abilities God will give you. But the abilities are there as a side effect, not the main benefit. They're just showing you that you're on the right path. Continue to go on learning and studying and doing the works that will help yourself and help those around you. The more you give, the more you get, especially in that spiritual way. So there's a lot to it, but the breathings is the fastest way to get these psychic abilities and never, never get them to misuse them on someone, even if they deserve it. There's a way, there's a way if someone deserves something, they can get paid back without you even doing anything, especially if you have God with you. <laughs> a lot of times, the people who are fully with God, when someone does something to them, Let's just say he works severely to protect his own. I've seen that a lot of times. In the same, in the opposite way, his protection is super perfect in advance too. So he's a good, he's a good God. So yeah, that's uh, uh you know, like it for the the powers. Yeah, the breathings, and if the person is really into it and wants, and it's good to develop the psychic abilities. They can. And as you do the breathings and learn more about psychic abilities, listen to tapes and videos and and learn and read, and you're doing these breathings and the dreams start coming, you will naturally be inclined to start doing a fast, to start once a week at least not eating anything at all. This will super clean your body. And just like Jesus and Moses went up to the mountain and fasted, that super cleans you. When a when a kid is sick with the 103 degree fever, he doesn't cry out for a hot dog. He cries out for juices, fruits, and the real natural stuff that can uh, open up all your psychic centers. So the cleaner you are, the uh, fasting and the breathings is the best way to get the psychic powers. And then by reading and studying about them. But those two will get to them and they'll, you'll have them strong too. So I love fasting. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I've done day fasts, but I mainly do them for health reasons because I think it's just good that we don't eat all the time and that our digestive system is just not overwhelmed with like, oh, let me have a snack here and let me have a snack there Um, because our bodies were not built for 7-Elevens and Uber Eats and all those kinds of things and having (laughs) fridges in in the house, right? (laughs) But I'm really, I know all of the benefits from a health perspective, and I'm a big fan of it, but I didn't know that there were so, there was so much to it from a spiritual perspective. And I'd like you to talk a bit more about how our body is then cleaner when we fast regularly and what you mean by, by a fast as well. Okay. Yeah. The fast is where the person just purposely decide to not eat for at least one 24 hours of a of a week one day a week he won't eat and in the initially the person will think i can't even i have to eat before i eat dinner tonight like i'm not even going to wait to eat before dinner 
So people are undisciplined, like in their area, like that's just physical, like rigorousness, being physically vigorous. The fast, like when the boy gets sick with a hot dog, when a person is sick, they don't eat at all until they're better. Same with the animals. So a lot of times, especially today, it's the food that we eat that literally make us sick. Like, the, like you were saying about the 7-Eleven, the big gulp, the sugar, the sodas, the, the liquor, the cigs, the oil, the pizza, all that junk. It super clogs us up. It clogs up our arteries, clogs up our vessels clogs up the vessels in our toes, in our feet. It, we're super clogged up, and that stuff is like wax. So a fast helps to unclog that. And what you do is you have a normal, solid meal at nighttime. You go to sleep. By the time you wake up, the fast is already half over because you slept through it. And so you break fast. That's like where the word comes from. So you have a good, solid meal so that you won't get up and be hungry. Have a nice anything you want. That's filling. Go to sleep. Wake up. The fast is halfway through. Around two o'clock, one between one and three that day. Say you ate dinner at six. So six p.m. the next day, you're allowed to eat again. Around one or two o'clock, between one and three, you're going to get super hungry. It may be between ten and eleven too. There's going to be one or two points in the daytime when you're going to get super hungry. But if you ignore them for 11 minutes, 9 minutes, 6 minutes, they'll go away. And you'll we'll have forgotten about it. Like four, 10 minutes later, if you were hungry, you'll continue on. If you lightly exercise during the fast, especially for girls or guys, this will super carve you. In the next day, you won't even believe how good you look. For the girls, the hair is super shiny. The skin is perfect. The, the legs and everything is trim the way it used to be. That's what movie stars do, like the, the lady on Bewitched. And merely, there are so many movie stars who fast, but they don't tell the public that to keep those shapes and to have the dynamite appearance, even though they were just drunk the night before. So the fasting really helps. It cleans you inside out. Your eyes work better. The hair is shinier. You can think more clear because you're finally getting all that stuff out of your, uh, your brain, out of your arteries, out of... Just for, and that's just for one day. And it's good not to overdo it. When you see how good the fast works, you'll always do them for the rest of your life. Like in the 80s, I used to get sick at least once a, a winter with like some kind of bronchitis or some kind of thing like that. I used to get it bad too. So I started fasting and I had been, been doing the meditations all my life, but I started fasting. And that... That fasting, I never get bronchitis like that ever again. And I really don't even get sick again. If I get something, it'll bounce away in 24 hours. But the fasting will clean you up and it rises you up spiritually too. Like your, your thinking will be more refined. Where the things you think about will be higher, of a higher nature. And you'll think inside more. You'll become more reflective. And your thinking will become more elevated. You'll become more elevated. And with the fact, and you'll look more elevated. And other people will notice something is different about you, but don't tell them what it is. Let cautious silence be a sacred sanctuary of spiritual wisdom. Uh, and then with the experiences too, because the fasting will definitely bring them on. Keep them to yourself for as long as you can. Because you see people, like you'll see people who have a near-death experience, or so they say, and then they'll, within two years, they're online telling people about them or writing a book about it before they even had time to like reflect on the near-death and examine it. Because as time passes, you remember more and see into it deeper, just like the man or the lady can see into a situation deeper when she's 25 than when she was 15 or 5. And that experience and maturity of judgment helps you when you reflect back on all your spiritual experiences. They become more in time and upon reflection. But the fastings help you physically and spiritually super well. And mixed with the breathings, you'll get the power strong. And if the powers become too strong, here's what will happen. The person will do the fasting, will want to be with God, will want to be up in a high way. They'll do the breathings, and the abilities will start to come. And sometimes, 
it's like a person, a good number to do is 18, 18 deep in and out breathing. Because I had one guy who did 100, but that's overdoing it, where you might have a psychic experience that you're not ready for. You always want to do it step by step, brick by brick, month by month. And this is like a lifetime thing where you're going to slowly build on it. And you do, you do just the fasting and breathing, even for a year, you'll see a big difference. But imagine 10, 15, 20 years, you'll get to the point where you just automatically know stuff or you'll be led to stuff. I don't, like, I don't consciously, unless I plan something out, I'll consciously do something. But a lot of times I'll let my subconscious call all the plays for me. And usually it's always right. Like here's a way where you can develop your subconscious. And that's probably the main part of your psychic capacity. Get a, a deck of cards and shuffle them and see if you can guess which card, every time you pick up a card, see if you can guess whether it's a red or black card. Practice that and see how it feels when you get it and see how it feels when you miss it. And you'll soon get to see which one of your intuitions is right. Like here's an example. You're at the carnival and they have the balloons up there and you have to throw the dart at the right one to get the prize behind the balloon. And let's say there's, let's say, okay, three balloons. There could be two or no matter what number. Usually your first immediate hunch or feeling will be the right one. But people always double think and pick the other one only to see that their first hunch was correct. And when you're picking those cards, if you just let yourself guess or say anything, even if it's wrong, because there is no wrong in this psychic exercise, it's only realizing which feeling was not the right one and which feeling was the right one. Now, some people will see, like I used to see the number coming up to me when I would, and don't over guess the number because you'll second guess. Sometimes go on first impulse, sometimes go on second thought. And then sometimes you have to reverse it. Sometimes you go on second thought and not first impulse. But it's interesting the mind with the fasting, and with the, the breathing, you'll get to know your sub, your higher mind better. You get to know it very well. And you'll get to listen to it and feel it when it tells you things. It'll tell you the exact right thing all the time. And it'll tell you ahead of time, but you have to listen. And the listening may come in a feeling or a voice or a whisper. It, it doesn't come loud unless there's danger. Here's an example. I used to live in Tennessee. So I was running down this hill one day and I used to, you know, do sports. So I was going to jump across the whole street, which I could have easily did. So I was, especially while running. So I was running down the hill and right before I jumped, something said, stop. And I stopped on one foot, literally. And a car of gangsters came right around the corner. And it's so close that it brushed the clothing. It would have hit me into the air, maybe... 40 feet. I would have gone high. I would have been dead on impact. And something said, stop out loud. And so you will have a loud voice, but when, when making decisions or sharpening, listen to the small voice inside or feeling and practice with those cards. Then, because there'll come a time within a month, if you do this every day, you can guess regularly, black, red, black, black, red, red, which just by the feeling, and you might even see the color in your mind. It works differently with different people. But get used to your listening to and playing games with your subconscious self. Because it'll tell you, especially if you test it. It wants to help you. And that, that stuff will help you in the future. And Because you might be getting onto a plane and something will tell you, just do not get on that plane. And you'll listen and save yourself some trouble. Because it's always looking out for you. And it will warn you ahead of time. So I hope that uh, Sabrina yeah yeah absolutely does um one thing you said earlier really stayed with me and that was don't share with people what you're doing and i'm always thinking especially with the research that you've done and the levels of consciousness that you've acquired um I can imagine sharing this knowledge that you have, as well as your experiences, isn't perhaps always seen as welcome. And 
there's a lot of, I think, even when we share any kind of story online, there will be good feedback and there will be naysayers. And first of all, I want to say it's extremely brave that you're putting yourself out there and I commend you for it. But my question is, how do you deal with people that don't trust or don't believe basically disrespectful comments, let's say? Yeah. And in this field, and it's good too, that usually the people, not so much for the UFO field, but the near death and, and the out of body dreams, the people are so interested in the info that at least with me, I don't get a lot of, there's always some clown saying something, but I don't get a lot of people, people want to hear it so much, but they just want the info or want to hear the story. And I don't get a lot of criticism. And in this one, in this field, I wouldn't even listen to any criticism, even if it were from one of the world authorities that I work with, because uh, it's easy to say something positive as it is to say something negative. And, but the people who study this kind of invisible spiritual science, usually they're not messed up like that in the character where they would say something. And the hunger for info is so strong that they just want to learn more and they're willing to listen. Some people take notes and there's not a lot of criticism, not that I've gotten. And I had, when I first came out in 2000 and then officially in 2014, I would wondered how people would take a black researcher or a black mystic and just like I said, in this field, the, the striving for knowledge invisible is so high that clowns, people only want to hear if it's true or if it sounds right. And you can usually tell if something's true because it rings true. And you can tell when people are saying something fake or phony. But the, and this is a, a high field, like life after death, that's super important, even more important than the aliens, because we will die, but all of us won't see a UFO, but we will die. And you, it'll come at when we least expect it. It'll be a surprise, unless it's a long lingering death. So it's important to know that we there is a God. It's important to know that there is a life after death, that we will be judged, not harshly, because he only, his main concern is if you love him. And if you love him, then you're in. Everything else can be overlooked. There's a, a lot of people who don't want to hear that, like families of like crime victims and stuff. But his wisdom goes way over ours, like centuries over. He knows what's best. But yeah, it's a good field to be in. There's been not a lot of critics because this information, mine is, and I was able to give information that was not just a story. But what you would expect to hear if someone had been working with scientists, you should expect to hear changes in the levels of consciousness, changes in the deviations in the invisible spirit body. Like here's a quote. There's uh, so many good quotes, but here's a quote that human beings were created by the creator in such a way that ecstasy is the only dependable method of conduct slash control for sentient beings. Ecstasy, a high spiritual level, is also associated with that process of transformation between life and death. So there's a lot of a lot of good knowledge and information. Memory is also a problem too. I have a, a note that I put up here. In just in the near death alone, we found seven memory issues that were looked into, and they are false memories problems with memory recall, how much the person can remember, memory retention, how much they retain from the original incident, memory retrieval, how they can they reach back and recall exactly what happened and, and double check it, memory retrieval, memory accuracy, especially with the spiritual memories. And we were talking about the illusionary veils of perception where a person may see something that's not even really there or just disappears. But there is a way you can pierce that veil, and I'll explain that too. And then memory suppression, in the near death a little, but especially in the UFO abduction, where they just erase everything. And so there's a lot to it. 
just like consciousness. We have streams of consciousness, like a dream is a stream of consciousness. We have divisions of consciousness, like the operating table of things. We have lapses in consciousness. I explained that. We have deviations in consciousness, especially as the person is ascending upward from the, from the lower stages into the higher stages as they get the, the levels of consciousness change and elevate. That's an interesting thing too, because those are permanent elevations. Then the illusionary veils of consciousness, that's an interesting thing too, where sometimes you're dealing with something that's not even there or it's just there and disappears. And then duality of consciousness, which is, the, is close to division of consciousness. But there's a lot to it. And uh, for the science-minded, and then for the uh, psychic or uh, mystical-minded, because to, to stand and merge with God, that's a high thing. And it'll change the person immediately, where you'll walk down the street and people will know there's something different about you. You'll talk to people and they'll they'll just know deep inside. but the person wants to practice those psychic exercises with the cards and with this. You can find you can find them online, any kind. Do the breathings, the fastings, and have a strong yearning to get with God and to test God, ask him for something. And there's a certain way that you can ask for things and get them. And if you over ask, you won't get it because you'll believe deep down inside that you're not going to get it because you're clawing after it. The person should be able to say, I want this and I'm going to get it one time. You can do it once a day, but, but to say it over and over, it depends on the person, but a lot of it is the belief in a person's mind. And so much of what happens to us, like who we meet, who we fall in love with and stuff like that, is starts with a belief inside the person's mind of what could be, what they want to be, what they hope to have, and what they want to have. So how you think, however you think, comes out in real life. And when you add emotions to it, that speeds it up. So everyone's heard the story about the guy who said, I give my left arm for a convertible, red convertible. And so he kept saying that and thinking about it deep inside. One day a truck came along. He had his arm out the window and tore it off. With the insurance money, he got the red convertible. But uh, he said, so you got to watch what you say, especially now. We're living in a time when you can say something and almost have it occur simultaneously. Like, I have this thing called rapid manifestation, where if I need something, I can get it immediately. A lot of times for free and a lot of times right away. Or I'll come to me. I'll just turn on the internet and whatever I need is there. And those things are super convenient. But that, that psychic, mystic thing keeps you in your own bubble, mystic bubble. You get the right people coming to you, keep the wrong ones away. It's just an interesting way of living. It's a higher way of living. And people are, I remember when just the scientists and the few experiencers were the only ones into this stuff. That was just like in 95. Now everyone's interested in it. And it's good because it's elevating them. But just like we have our group who are elevating and learning rapidly, and we are, the other, there's another 40% that are devolving in the opposite way, going maniac crazy. So it's a balance. It is. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier that I wanted to go a bit deeper in is you said in this day and age, at this time, it's easier to get anything that we want more so than in the past. Is that coming from an energetic point of view or why is now a better time than it was previously? Yeah, it's not because of, I mean, the tech development like the internet and stuff helps and all that helps speed it up. But the actual of something desired, the, I don't know if you could call it the alignment of the planets or the age of the Aquarius, but there's something happening now in this time uh, from, let's say, maybe 2019 or so, but definitely now and definitely in this decade. Who, I don't know how long it will last. But there's, the conditions are right where the magnetism is such that you can get what you want really fast compared to 10 years ago. You can get it super fast. And it's not with the technology. You can, I mean, just a mind to universe thing. There's a way where the person can interface with the universe because it's alive and we're alive with it. When I had my near death, I listened to the planet 
and I was still for a second. And the planet had a heartbeat, and the heartbeat was this match the same as mine. And we were one in unison beating at the same time. So I realized that I was literally connected to the earth and to the soil, to the air, physio spiritually connected and connected to the plants. Everything looks super alive, and you can feel it once you put your attention on it. And the same way now, there's something happened in the material world while we're awake that things move to us according to the focus and the, especially the, the emotion in with it. Not, not fear that you won't get it, but confidence that you will. So much confidence that you'll say, I'm going to have this. And there's been kids who, when they're little, said, I'm going to be a famous rock singer. I'm going to be a famous movie star. And almost all of them turned out to, like Madonna was a good example. And others knew that they were going to be something. A lot depends on what you think and what you think is possible. Anything is possible if you think it is. Uh, the more imaginary, the better. So it's it's a deep thing. Yeah, yeah but uh, and so it's but to answer your question, from, uh, Sabrina, yeah, there's something happening with the magnetic of the Earth and the universe, and we are mag mag magnets ourselves. We're electric and electromagnetic by nature. So when we interact with that invisible force, that is also electromagnetic. And the thought and the, the visual picturing of the image, it's important to think of what you want as a picture and see the picture in your mind, see yourself having it. And keep know that you're going to get it and tell yourself that you deserve it and tell the universe that you want it literally tell the universe or God and God that you want it. And when, as you begin to go and do things to get it, it will be coming towards you, especially if you add strong emotion to it. That's why you want to control your emotions because super strong controlled emotions is a, is a incredible thing. Focused energy is impossible to defeat. And the athletes know that. And that card game where you're guessing which color that's another, that's a loosely focused energy where you're letting the information come in because people are senders and they're receivers and a person can do both. You just have to find out which is your strong suit, sending and receiving, and then strengthen up the weaker side. But there's a lot to learn. The older the books that you can read about spirituality and mysticism, the better. The older, the better. Those guys are super smart. In fact, I got a good book for you later that I'll tell you after the show that you will love. It was written by a 14th century priest who wrote it for young princes and princesses who were about to take the throne. And it is deep. But so there's a lot of things that the person can have, especially if they align themselves, align their subconscious up with God. When you, when you say, I want to get this thing, then you ask God to help you get it you know that's that's where you can get things immediately too and you can literally get them immediately you just got to try it if you ask god for something and you got to try it and you know, learn as much as you can about god and you can get anything you want literally just by thinking about it there's more to it than that but if you know what you want that's the main start most people don't know what they want in anything you can ask them and they'll, they'll literally tell you. So it's good to know what you want. Focus on it. Ask God to get in it. Beg him. He will. And then use your own subconscious. Let yourself just go to it or tell it to come to you. And we have to use the magic within us. There's a lot of it. And we can have it for free. So it's time to use that power that God gave us. That connects us more with him when we use it anyway. I'm really excited to try it. I have a few things on my list, so I'll give it a go. Okay, I'll do good. Breathing and I'll do my fasting, and then I'll ask really strongly. I'll focus on my emotions, wow. and I'll let you know when they come true. That's good. To, and it's good because you're still young. It's good to do it when you're young because, I mean, because there's so much to and the, the more you develop yourself inside, the more you develop, like the inner begins to match the outer, or the outer will match the inner. The higher you are inside, the more beautiful and, and cemented you'll look outside, and people will see it. 
in guys and girls. So to develop yourself on the inside, you develop yourself on the outside and people will see it. And they'll see there's something different about you, but don't tell them what. Let them, let them, sometimes it's good to let people figure things out for themselves. It's good to share stuff too. But when a person has a psychic or spiritual experience, especially in the beginning, they should keep it to themselves and check it and study it. And then after they know for sure what it is, then they can release it. But it's good to reflect and it's good to keep some things inside because people will drain you if you let them. It's not good to be too nice, not in this world. That's what I was going to say, because one thing that was said to me that sounds very similar to what you were just saying, which is don't share with people at the beginning until you can control it. And somebody said to me, and it, it does sound true, that I'm both a, an introvert, I knew that already, and that I'm an empath. And that's very true because I do tend to pick up energies quite easily so if somebody is sad around me then it will make me sad if somebody's super happy it will it will affect my energy so yeah. you can imagine just going out on the street you get people annoyed and unhappy and yes. all of that yes. and that person said to me because you are so sensitive to the energies of others just ask your guides to put out a mirror when you go out so that everybody just gets their energy back and you don't just take it and just make sure to cleanse your energy just by saying so every evening. But that's what I wanted to get into as well. The way we are picking up energies from the others. And when you're saying we shouldn't share things with other people, is it because their thoughts, their opinions, um, perhaps their disapproval if we talk about family or close friends, can that affect us energetically? Yes. And like when I say don't, I don't say don't share. I say let cautious silence, let careful silence be a sacred sanctuary, a safe place to be of spiritual wisdom. And that means to share, but don't share everything. Here's like, here's, if you help, if, if you help someone a lot of times and you help them valuably, a lot of times in this world, uh, they'll take it and run and they're gone. However, if you help someone and it doesn't turn out right for them or not in the way that they liked it, they will blame you for literally helping them. So you have to be careful with people. You can share with people, but what I meant don't share, don't share initial experiences of psychic things keep them in reflection for a while at least till you understand yourself what's happening until you see how people might respond to it but initially the things you learn the things you abilities you get keep them to yourself for a while and let them build up so that when you're asked you can explain it fully or when you have to use it use those powers on someone you can do it fully and then when you're fully developed and you know exactly what you're talking about, then you can share it. But on the stage of development, keep it in, keep a lot of it in, uh, unless you have someone that you practice with. But if you're developing yourself, keep those studies to yourself until you're a master of them. Along the way, there'll always be time to share things with people. You can share things and energy and time with people without sharing what people call forbidden esoteric knowledge and it's up to you to fully fill your temple or your mind with those things until you understand it and then pass it down to the appropriate people like your daughters or your parents especially once you understand it there's a lot to learn and it takes a lot to study and to practice these things so with those things, a person wants to get to a higher level. They really don't have time to go running around telling people what they think and what they did. Just study inside and or with someone who's in that way and cement yourself because you're getting to know that other half of yourself and you're integrating it and mixing it with your own awake self. So the invisible you and the real you are meeting and it and with any, if you're going to share it with anyone, share it with your higher self or with your inner self. 
who understands you fully and will protect you fully. But people can be weird and people can be strange. Most people are cool, but no one's perfect. And with these studies, it's good to, I mean, because sometimes these studies are hard earned and you just don't want to give it away to someone who may not appreciate it, who may not even ask for it, or who might not understand understand it. And a lot of times on the path to development, the student is not developed enough to explain it to another in a way where it could get the person thinking about it and liking it. So it's best to develop develop it up front first and then share. But yeah, you have to be careful because you have to be careful of the people with lower characters. There's a lot of users out here. And it's better to listen to other people, see what they're saying, than to give out full info. I've given out a lot. And it's funny because I see people using the exact same lines like I, I've used on my website or on my resume or wherever, psychic stuff. And that's not, I don't mind that really, especially the record people. And I always watch to see if researchers or writers or scientists do it. I had one scientist who tried to steal some, uh, re- some of the near-death, life-after-death research from me. I knew he was going to try it, so I gave him the research, the, gave him the raw data in reverse. This is my raw data that I s- reversed it on him to see if he would steal it. He did, and he put it on his bulletin board the next day, the reverse information, not knowing that I had given him the opposite of what he thought. And I let him think, I, he's, I don't think he even knows to this day. But you'll get to that stage where people can't even trick you because something will tell you or something will let you know, or they'll get paid back for even trying to. Like I said, it's a great protector. And you get involved with God and you want to be with him. You want to merge with him. There's that movie called The Messenger about Joan of Arc with Milja Jovovich. That's a good one to see because she was in that female mystic flow. and. Uh, if you can remember that, that's a good one to see. She so, but once you're in that that state, that life, you will be there for life because it's so valuable. And you, the first development is to yourself, so that you can work for God in His service. And when you develop yourself, God will develop you. And to the highest develop, He gives His highest gift. And when He gives you something, it's overflowing. It never stops. So you rarely have to ask him for anything because he always gives you like whatever you need. And if people say, I want to see God and you mean it, he'll show himself to you. But he'll do it in his time. But you can see God. All you have to do is ask. Fantastic. This has been so exciting. But I also wanted to shift gears a bit because I know that you do a lot of work with UFO research and actions. And I have to say, I'm an absolute blank canvas. I know absolutely nothing about it, never looked into it. So tell me more about the work that you do. And to your knowledge, is this happening? Are there other entities in outer space? Uh, And maybe at a level that somebody without a lot of prior knowledge can understand. Yeah, that's a good question, Sabrina. And yeah, I do study the UFO thing too. Yeah, when I was, let's see, I guess I was around around four or five. We had bunk beds, me and my brother. I was on the top bed. And one night I was laying there, with, you know, on my back. And I saw what we would call like a, 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 a one of the small aliens look right over my head like that when I was laying down. He looked right over my head. I looked at him, then I think I went under the covers and I don't remember anything after that. But then when I was 11 or 12, my dad saw some 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 scars on my inner thighs. I had short pants on, it was summertime. We were cutting the grass. He said, Eugene, what are those scars? I said, I don't know, I've always had them. I would later ask Dr. Jacobs about these scars. They were abduction scars. They looked like they were long scars on my inner thighs and they they stretch when you pull them they stretch like rubber bands and go right back to their own shape and they're staples scars unlike the kind of any that you see that doctors perform so i told dr jays he he said yeah they were abduction scars and during my out-of-body experiences i had often fought 
the beings that were holding me down, paralyzing me, and just interfering with the dream, the nightly dream episode. And at 19, I saw my first UFO. I was with a friend, Roger. We were in Ohio, and that's a hot spot state for UFOs. Like, in fact, the county we were in is super hot spot state in the country. I wish I would have known that then. But so we saw one, and he doesn't remember anything. And mine is fuzzy too. Like, we had that missing time, and we saw a saucer, and we saw it. We were driving, we were driving west. It was right around seven o'clock, still light out. And he was driving. I said, Roger, look. And right outside his window was a saucer UFO. And I got out. I was on the passenger side. So I got up on the roof. You know, I sat on the door handle. I got to drive it and looked over the roof at it. And he was in the car. And everything in that scene <coughs> froze. Nothing moved. Even though we could see the headlights of other cars down the street, nothing moved. And then there were some rough after effects from that UFO sighting a couple of weeks later. But I had had the near death, the UFOs, and the other body, all within the span of like five years. So I was going through a lot uh, during those teenage years. But our family earlier, like when I was between the ages of what, six and 10, you've heard of Betty and Barney Hill? They were the, the first proven, they were a black and white couple from New Hampshire. They were the first proven people to actually be abducted. And this was proven by the U.S. military. Uh, this was in the 60s. They were friends of my mom and dad. So we got to meet them. In fact, before she died, she's really famous. She's one of the UFO icons. Before she died, I went back to her house since we knew her and got a last interview with Betty Hill, a three-hour interview, where I asked her all about UFOs as the mystic. At that same time, I was working with Dr. Jacob, the UFO in the 90s of World Authority in Alien Abduction. And a lot of people these days don't say alien abduction, although that's what scares people the most. Um, as the near death brings primal, the UFO abduction almost always brings primal fear. There's something not cool about it, the way they sneak in the room at night. When your levels of consciousness are at the lowest, you're barely awake, and here they come, invisibly. They come in your dreams. They have a hunger and an obsession with our kids. Like I said, I saw one when I was little. They can read our minds. They can put thoughts into our minds. They float. They disappear. Everything about them shows that they're, it's a spiritual phenomenon. These beings are psychological in method, spiritual in nature, and many people believe that they are they may be demonic in origin. Scientists, UFO scientists, government scientists from the 50s believe that. And they made a group called the Collins Elite. These were a group of UFO scientists, non-religious and religious scientists who felt that there was something malevolent about the ET presence. And Dr. Jacobs is in that same away and so am i there is something strange dark and secretive not just in the way that the governments don't talk about them but in the the very movements of the aliens themselves in the 50s they said they came from the pleiades the, uh, the 40s they said they came from mars in the 60s they said andromeda strains and all these different stories they can appear to look like your grandmother or appear to look like your future a grandchild so it's a lot of weirdness, a lot of deception. The top UFO guy, Jacques Vallée from France, is called the messengers of deception. There's something not cool about that. And that's what my second book's going to be about. Every, so much of what they do would easily be seen as unholy, even from a spiritual or religious angle. But there's something not right about them, where they do surgery on people. Like I said, they go after the children. They repress our memories. There's too many red flags, but that is not cool. And while working with both the near-death and UFO scientists, I saw into things, things that they did not, because I had an understanding of both, where those guys only understood their own field. The near-death guy didn't understand UFOs. The UFO guy didn't understand dreams. And the dream guy didn't understand out of And onwards. The mystic had a 
a clear understanding or any spirit of all of those things. And, and just like the rooms of God's mansion, these are rooms, these paranormal rooms are also connected. Here's an interesting thing. The near death and the UFO alien abduction both have what the scientists both have what the scientists call the controller. And what I call the controlling agent in charge. This controlling agent in charge is in every experience and aspect of the esoteric and paranormal and moves about it in his own will and does as he will there. This controller is what humans would call God, but the scientists call the controller because not only are they not allowed to believe in God, it's against them to even talk about God. So that's why they call it the controller because back in the 90s, you're not going to get do scientific research at a university and then talk about some God. That's how the camp itself, which was wrong because not including the spirituality only hinders them from any advancement. Like there's a saying, true spirit, true spirituality. Science will always lag woefully behind true spirituality. And that's true. The spiritual ones are way ahead of the scientists. And uh, one scientist said, we, sh we don't even know what consciousness is, but the regular normal experiences do. But anyway, the scientists held the, 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 any information about the controller away from the general public because it represented a God force or the opposite of a God force. And, and they weren't allowed to talk about that or even look into it. But I was allowed and I looked into it myself. And it was what I had surmised it would be. And that'll be in book two. So it's deep. That's exciting. So I'm already and, looking uh, forward to your second book. But it's, be going, it's going to be, it's going to blow away the first book. And the first book was magnificent. The first book was, I wrote stuff that where God wrote it, I just held the pen. Because there's some deep stuff in the first book where we explain the deviations in the invisible spirit body the the death process the the white lights it's so much more than what we hear in the stories like here's a, a quote whenever there is a deviation in one's levels of consciousness there's also a simultaneous deviation in the invisible spirit body and at the same time acting as a triad there's a an equal whenever there's a deviation in one's levels of consciousness there's also a deviation in the invisible spirit body at the same time acting as a triad there's also a deviation in dimensional time and space so whenever your levels of consciousness changes the spirit body also changes so that's, those two things work at the same time whenever one works the other one so whenever there's a change in either your spirit body the invisible spirit body or your levels of consciousness like your thoughts what goes on in your mind there's also a dimensional change in space and time. And that's how you go from here to there. So the thought changes the invisible spirit body. And when those two things happen, speed or motion occurs. And that's how you travel from one place to the other. So it's an interesting field. There's a lot to it, though. And there's a lot just to the near death. But the, both fields are interesting. And uh, people have try, been trying to get me to tell what I know about the, uh, the UFO thing. but. Uh, I held back the near death for a while and then let that go. To show the people that I knew what I was talking about, I said, let me solve the life after death. Let me solve the near death. And then they'll know that I'm for real with the UFO thing too. Because the UFO thing, see, it's ongoing now. And it's not good. The near death primal, that's the UFO primal fear. And it's, it's, it's dark, but it's uh, super interesting. And it's going to be deep. It's going to be deep. It's going to be deep. this book too will sum it. It was originally Sabrina one book, part UFO, part life after death. I said, let me do the UFO. Doctor Jacob, the UFO guy, wanted to. He said, let's come out with it with the UFO. I said, no, because life after death is more important. So I split it in two because it would be too much for the normal reader to handle the life after death, then go to the UFO thing too, which is super complicated. Where the life after death was basically, was mainly memory and then experience too. The experience helped a lot for me to piece together that, but a lot was good memory. 
where the near death is happening now and change it's changed constantly changing where these things are adapting and changing and the story is getting wild where people are seeing them walking around the streets and stuff or so they say but there's a thing now happening with the world that we're beginning to the invisible world there there was a there is a barrier that protects our world from outside entities like demons or or things like that that barrier is and maybe this is why people can get things that they want but that barrier is dissolving and not as solid as it was and things are getting in and they seem to be in the extremes where people are going super wild or they're going soaring to a super high height um, but this is a, a time where things can be gotten and knowledge can be gotten and knowledge is a good thing to get a really good thing um, there's a lot to know and it's good sometimes to, to keep it to yourself there will always be a time to talk most people don't know when to be quiet but it's good to be quiet and sometimes hold something in that's real good real juicy but the ufo thing is going to be deep it's going to be ooh. when is the book coming out do you know well it's halfway done now the research part is done so i have to really do is fill it in but then there's a thing with the publishers and uh, all that. And I learned a lot from the first book, the publishing and all that. That's a that's a gagging thing, too, with the publishers. But the, the second book, behind the scenes, details would be better, sharp, because I know what to do more now. But as far as coming out, I haven't, you know, I spent half of my life with the near death and the research and then writing that book. So I'm not in any deep hurry to run and, and finish it. I do have it halfway done and the, the research is done. So once I type up the explanatory parts, but it's now it's something that, and I held back the near death for a long time, but had to release it when the first book was ready. But it's something that no one could figure out. And <laughs> they're gonna love it. No one could, it's the, it's in plain sight, the basis of the book, but no one can see it. In the same way that the near death was there for all to see, and like you can see something better when it's put together, but this UFO thing is super deep. Just like in life, like a person goes to sleep and has a dream, has an out of body and they're flying in the out of body. But the subset of that out of body is that he was actually in bed asleep. The reality of the out of body was that yes, he had the out of body, but he was physically in bed asleep. That was the subset, just like, uh, dream these the being asleep is a subset of a dream there's always a subset of things the near death has a subset a deeper reality than than is what is presently noticeable and so i there's a deeper reality to the near death and a deeper reality to the ufo alien abduction and it is super deep and so there's there's always there's a and so it's an interesting field a lot to study and think over and it's a high field because it involves our our higher selves god and all of the universe that we interact with anyway you just have to like the universe is like a universal mind in our subconscious our higher mind can is connected to it and connected to, to god so when we went we can communicate with the universe and with god we are the universe and we're literally just communicating with ourselves or a higher self. But there's a lot of things where you can go to see that. Like if you go up to a tree and say, I want to see if you're alive and will, con and will respond to me and hug the tree, the tree will move and you'll feel, you'll have to hold on. It won't, people won't see it. And you might not even see it move, but you'll feel it move. That's a deep thing. <laughs> I did that one, but there's a lot to it. And that merging quality, there's another example. I was sitting in a tree, the same tree that I hugged while my son played with his friends. I saw a squirrel in another tree looking right at me. I thought that took a lot of nerve. So I started looking at the squirrel because I would always practice focusing on things because that improves your eyesight. And when you can focus on like the desire of your object, what you want to get, so you see it inside your mind where someone has to say, hey, wake up. You're seeing it, that, that's the kind of laser focus that will get you things that you want. So when I saw the squirrel, look, I, I started looking at him or, or started to look in, into him to see why was he looking at me. 
and then I shot out of myself into the squirrel and then back into myself within one second. And I could see from his eyes, him looking at me when I was in him. So that merging quality, just like a road, a cross country runner will be running and they'll suddenly pop out of their body. It's happened to me in cross country. And you can look that up. The cross country guy will pop out of his body, see himself running for a few steps and then pop back in. And those spontaneous out of body occur when that's definitely spiritual, but when the person develops, you'll start having that stuff. There are three types of bodies, spontaneous, controlled and uncontrolled out of body and it's the uncontrolled out of body that's interesting not the uncontrolled but the forced out of body that that gets into the uh, ufo thing but it's interesting all of that's interesting there's a lot to learn so the studying the breathings the fasting and then you'll be on your way and like a whole new different world will open and you can use that world to help you get things in this world because that's what it's there for. And that's what God is here for. It's not wrong to want to get things. And it's not wrong to get things. As long as they're good things and you want them for a good reason. And uh, if you ask God to help you, you'll get it super fast. And it'll be golden. You'll get the best of what he And ask him to give you something and watch how good it is when you really get it. That's when you'll never leave him again. So it's a deep thing, and God is always at the heart of it. Without Him, we wouldn't even be alive. Beautiful. You said it really well. Absolutely. Yes. He kept His promise of life after death, like He said He would. The person will not die. They will literally, just like PMH, the world authority, they will literally wake back up. It will, it'll be just like you're going to sleep, and then you'll wake back up, and you'll remember who you were. You, you won't, you're, you'll retain your identity, your personality. So it's good to see young people like you involved. In, you're going to be smart. You what? In 20 years, oh, man. So you guys are studying. And you, you like grew up with it. We had to kind of sneak around and study it when we were kids because they didn't have a lot of books on it. And then you kind of, they would kind of look at you weird if you talked about, you couldn't talk about out of bodies or I came out of my body or I died and came back to life. They would quickly take you to a crazy house. But uh, you so we had to study it in libraries and stuff and watch TV shows about it until like the 80s and 90s when there was more information. So that's, maybe that's where I got the holding it in because back then we weren't even allowed to talk about it. And I didn't tell anyone about my near death for 10, yeah, in, for 10 years. But, you know, but yeah, it's a wonderful field for anyone to get into, especially like my son's into it. And I'm glad he, your guys are close to the same age. I'm glad you guys are into it because it will enhance you heavily. And you're gonna be you're gonna be 300 as, as self-actualized by adding the psychic mystical side. You'll be completely self-actualized, 360 degree, fully developed human. And people will see that and be drawn to you. And you'll have the abilities will come naturally. It'll be good. You'll love it, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited. I mean, I have to say the spiritual realm is new for me it's not something that i've been looking into for a long time but it's definitely really exciting and i'm also pacing myself through it and so yeah. somebody did say that i i did hear that i might have psychic abilities but i also i think at that point i was just too overwhelmed to just think about it and also nothing has happened but i also think it's because i didn't want and don't want anything to happen because oh, no? I, I will be overwhelmed by it can i give you a psychic test to test you there's just yeah. like about 10 questions easy questions you you, you can, can say yes. i don't know that i have it i've just been told once that i might i can test you to see like your psychic aptitude or capacity okay that's just like eight or nine easy questions like yes or no okay okay have you ever had a falling dream or yeah. flying dream? Okay. Yeah. Both yeah, flying and like, like like sort of like walking and then the next step you're sort of like just falling as if like the earth just like disappeared. Now, did you have that when you were awake or asleep? Asleep. Okay. Okay. Have you ever been walking, especially as a kid, and heard someone call your name and turn around and no one's there? Possibly. I, I don't remember an instance, but it sounds like it might have happened. 
Okay. Have you ever been falling to sleep and heard music or a voice like call you or heard things as you're going to sleep? No. Okay. But also I'd be terrified of it. So I would probably be terrified of it. Well, I I know. It can be a, it can be a shock. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Right. Or, okay, right-handed. Do you dream in color? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Those are some of the main ones. Have Have you ever had deja vu? Yeah, yeah, many times. Okay. 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 Those are about it. You sound like you're pretty psychic. Okay. Yeah. Is that Is that Would you like to have the psychic abilities and stuff? I don't. I think my answer now is I don't know. My answer maybe a year back would have been no. Okay. And I think it's always because I've been really afraid of everything unknown um, and anything that I, I can't see or just the idea that, yeah, just the idea of anything unknown is is scary. Yeah. So I also <laughs> think that even if I had, and that's what I said to the person who told me that I might have psychic abilities, um, she was a psychic, so she just looked at my picture and she said, like, you, you do have these abilities. And I said, but, like, I really don't want them. Can't somebody better? See, get you them? might, but sometimes the people who don't want them have a lot of them, have a lot of psychic abilities, like a, like a reluctant psychic. But sometimes the people don't want them, sometimes they have a lot. Or they might have a reason to uh, to fear them. Maybe something happened or... Maybe it's a lot of like just like the paral the paralyzation that's scary too, and or falling in a dream in a flying dream that's scary too. So there's a lot because I remember I was freaked out a lot of times too. And but it's worth it. It's worth it to be scared because there's so much. It opens up a whole new world. Like when you know things in advance. Oh, my best girlfriend's coming over, or she's in trouble, or. When you know things, I got to go to see my mom now. When you know things in advance that can help you, or I should apply for this job, I'm going to get it. You know, it can, that can help. You know, like the breathings can help the person and the fasting be so sensitive that, and every person should be able to, when they're quiet enough to hear their own heartbeat or feel it. And if you can't feel it, hold your breath for a few seconds and then you'll feel it. But every person should be clean enough and quiet enough to hear or feel their own heartbeat. And then with the breathing, you'll be able to slow it down or speed it up. That's a good thing too. So it's a lot of good things that the person can do with these qualities. I mean, what I've been trying to do in any case is just being more in tune with my intuition and trusting it a bit more. I think yes. before that, I didn't realize that I tend to get a good sense about people when I meet them. So I will know if I like them or not, and I will know if they like me or not. And usually I'm right for most of those things. So I always thought like, I never cared about it very much, but I think since that moment, I've been a bit more open and trusting of if I meet someone and for whatever reason, it just doesn't add up, then I will just not even look further i will just because i think there's just something in there that i haven't caught on yet yes and here's a, a good exercise that can show you that you do have psychic abilities and you can also practice like if you're in a room or on a bus is the best place or a subway where people are and they're just sitting there or a park and look at someone especially if you're on a bus or someone look at the back of their head and focus only on the back of their head and then tell tell them inside you're going to be talking to their mind so tell them inside their mind from your mind to go to sleep especially if you see someone already sleepy and look at the back of his head and tell them and keep saying sleep sleep and you'll see his head start to go down and then if you do the breathings while you're telling them to sleep when you breathe out you'll see him go way down <laughs> yes oh, wow <laughs> yes or you can tell someone to turn around or look at me and you'll see them turn around and look right at you. Like if a guy's trying to get a girl's attention or a girl's trying to get a guy's turn, look at me. And say that over and over while you're looking at the person. They'll hear you. 
or feel it and they'll turn right around or you can put someone asleep it's fun to do that when you when you say that it's in less scary for sure yeah because like with the sleeping one when you catch someone who's not foc fully focused they're just kind of daydreaming and they're in a leisurely state a relaxed state and their mind is not focused it's easier to contact them with your mind like their mind especially if they're just sitting around they're just relaxing watching tv and that's the perfect time because their their subconscious mind is not doing nothing but their conscious mind is watching the tv but their higher mind is just waiting there and so you can contact their higher mind with your higher mind by thinking and it will hear you even though they won't know yeah so that's there are a lot of there are a lot of interesting things you can do that's why the person has to be super cool with a good character and not you know doing any because those things reverse if you do it in a mean way to someone who doesn't do it you'll get the punishment that you were supposed to give to them so it works well when you use it well but there's a lot of good things like that you can do with the mind with people like suppose a girl is out with a guy and they're on a date and she wants to go to a steakhouse or get she wants to go she wants to do something in particular i want to go to the mall if she keeps saying it inside her mind to the guy's mind, she doesn't even have to look at him. Just say, let's go to the mall. Let's go to the mall. And she lets it go. And knowing that he's going to hear it in a few minutes later, he'll say, hey, you want to go to the mall? And you'll say, hmm, I should have thought about that myself. But there's ways where you can contact. It shows how easy it is to contact someone else's mind and how easy it is to use your own higher mind. And you can literally do that to someone while you're talking to them. While you're listening to them or talking to them, your higher mind can be thinking about the mall or the hamburger place. And while they're talking, that mind pops in a few, a few minutes after you've said it, especially if you say it silently inside your mind a few times. They'll, their higher mind will hear it and will tell them, let's go get a hamburger. And <laughs> they'll think it's their idea. And, and they will treat you. Okay. So that's a, uh, it's a lot of, it can be used for fun. And, but that's, uh, yeah, so we're only partially developed. And a lot of us are really fractured. But that, that spirituality is a way we can heal ourselves and heal ourselves well and completely. Because it has everything necessary, even a God who will help us if we get stuck. He'll help us for free. And uh, He can do anything. He can make your parents. Live to a long. I used to pray to God to make my parents live to a long age. Dad lived to 91. Mom lived to 102. And so, uh, with God and with your own higher mind, you can literally have anything in this world and get it quick. Especially if you know exactly what you want. And then you put God in it, you'll have it. That's an amazing message. Thanks. What I wanted to end on, Eugene, is how can people find you and your work? Yeah, I have a website. If you go to Eugene Braxton at wixwx.com or uh, America's Mystic at wix.com or just Google or, you know, online and you'll find the website there. You can also order the book there. There's a lot of good info, but the bulk of the info is in the book and it is packed with it. And wow. But yeah, and so I urge any of you guys who want to know any more about dream recall, any of that stuff, to get the book. And it's not expensive. It's like $15. When it first came out, Sabrina, the price, suggested retail price was $1,059. President Clinton and Bush heard about it, and we had them put it down. I didn't like it being that price. They moved it down to $800. Now it's down to, you know, where the normal person can afford twenty dollars fifteen dollars but it once sold for one thousand that's how good it is so do get a copy and if you can get it from the website especially if you're in america but uh, if not you can get it online elsewhere but it's a deep book and the second one's going to be even better really excited for that one perfect thank you so much eugene for being on today